Church in Dallas, Texas, and I'm here with our senior pastor, Todd Wagner. And Todd, today's question is a good one. Can you lose your salvation? Well, this is going to be real truth real quick. No. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for having me. So you have this pastor's answer to the question, can a Christian lose their salvation? Well, we're going to analyze what pastor, as he is, Wagner here has to say about this issue. We'll play the whole thing. We're going to go through the video. It's a short little video, and we're going to t listen to the biblical arguments that he makes, and we're going to analyze them and see where his error is. I'm going to tell you about him in just a second. Now, I'm going to say why we do this, of course. These are important issues. We want to know, of course, friends, what is the teaching that comes from the New Testament? What does the Bible have to say about a Christian's salvation? You know, this is called many things. Eternal security. It's called perseverance of the saints. Preservation of the saints. It's called once saved, always saved. The impossibility of apostasy. Well, we're going to take a look at this now. This is a video that I just came across randomly, but this, uh, I know and I've found out that this church, I think it's called the Watermark Church in Dallas, Texas, is a pretty popular church. And so we want to review what this pastor has to say. And I'm going to tell you why. Is it to demean him? Of course not. It is for the sake of truth. It is to... Oh, friends, there's so much error out there, and I want the truth to be known. And it's not to say that this pastor doesn't, but he doesn't have the truth, his intentions notwithstanding. But I want you to know the truth. Once saved, always saved is the original lie. You know, the very first lie ever told by the devil in the garden was, now keep in mind that God had said, if you eat of the tree, you shall die. And what did the devil say? The devil said, you shall not surely die. Well, that's what once saved, always saved is. And when it comes from teachers and preachers like Charles Stanley, it's even more dangerous who say you could actually, even if you fall back into sin, and even if you were to die that way, that you would actually still be saved. Now, I don't have any, I don't have, let me tell you this, Calvinist, and if you know me, you know that I disagree with Calvinistic theology. It is not biblical it cannot be harmonized with what the New Testament teaches. But you know what? Calvinists, they have a lot more ground to have this position than someone like Charles Stanley. At least the Calvinists say that someone truly saved, regenerated, is not going to go back into sin, can't. Their nature won't allow it. But you have... Uh, Baptist theologians like Charles Stanley that just have this, and I have a video about Charles Stanley, you could check that out, where I'm doing the same thing, says that even if you fall back into sin, yeah, you're still going to be saved. Yeah, you might have a miserable life, so on and so forth. But anyway, I don't want to get into Charles Stanley right now. But let's talk about uh, this pastor. Todd Wagner is his name. He is the senior pastor, he's called and he's the founder of Watermount, Watermark Church in Dallas, Texas. You know, when I listen to him, I see, I say it like this, when I listen to him, I hear what the average Joe pastor and teacher is going to say. And so I thought, this is very good to listen to him, and because you're going to get a feel for what generally other preachers and teachers are going to say, and we're going to interact, see the error of what he has to say. Now, friends, I want to tell you something. The reason I like to do these things is because I know there are a lot of Christians out there, and they want to see these truths. You know, people that even realize that, yes, a Christian can lose their salvation if they, if they continue into sin, they go back into sin. But I know there's a lot out there, even though they hold that position, and they listen to preachers like we who teach this biblical teaching that you can go back into uh, sin. And it's like, it sounds good, it looks biblical to me, but you know what? They want to see these things actually put up against real-world opponents of this teaching, such as this gentleman here. And I've, when I say opponent, I just mean a preacher, a teacher, that teaches the opposite of this position, that a Christian can go back into sin. And 
We'll get into the scriptures. We'll get into the text here in just a little bit, but we're going to listen to what he has to say. And so, at this time, that's what we're going to do. I want to pull up that video once again. Let's listen. All right, let's give it. This is not Todd's take. We've always said if it's not in the Word, forget what you heard. So let's give biblical reasons for why I just said. First of all, when somebody says, can I lose my salvation? That's really more a question about your shepherd than it is you as a sheep. In other words, if Jesus is the one, and he is, by the way, that said my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, it says that I give eternal life to them. He gives it to them. It says they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. In fact, in the very next verse, John 10, 28, it says the Father will keep them and no one will take them out of the Father's hand. Okay, we're going to back it up a little uh, little bit when we listen to it again. But did you hear what he had to say? The first argument, the first claim that he makes is, well, concerning a Christian losing their salvation, that's a question of what kind of pastor, I'm sorry, what kind of shepherd do you actually have? It says more about your shepherd. Now, if you don't understand what he's saying, he's saying that this is the implication here. If a Christian can actually end up lost once again in his sins and end up dying and going to a devil's hell, that doesn't say something good about the shepherd. What kind of shepherd is that? So that's basically his his argument. In other words, if Jesus is really a good quality shepherd, he's not going to allow his sheep to get lost. That would be that would be bad. That would make him a bad shepherd. So what does the Bible have to say about that? Now there's two things we need to look at. Think about the argument here for a second. Now, the second thing we're going to look at is the actual biblical error of that argument. But here's the first thing I want to say. Is this gentleman going to be consistent? So he's saying, if once you're his people saved and you go back into a state of sin, if you lose faith or you rebel against Christ and you go back into the world and thus are not saved anymore, then that makes him a bad shepherd. Okay, now... Is Mr. Wagner actually going to be consistent? Well, let's take a look. What I have here, we're going to go to the scriptures. Let me pull this up. Actually, let's go to Psalm 80. Here's what this psalm has to say. Uh, Going past the uh, introductory remarks here in Psalm 80 and verse 1, it says, Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who led Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. Now, notice verse 4. Well, let me just read go on. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. O God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears, and you have made them to drink tears in large measure. Now, I want you to notice what is being said. You see, God was the shepherd of Israel. Of course, we know the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, right? From David, Psalm 23 there. So he was a shepherd of Israel. But if you recall, anybody that knows their Old Testament history is going to know all the bad things that happened to Israel out of the wrath of God. You know, Israel was his people. He calls himself their shepherd. And when they rebelled, you remember the wrath that gets poured on them? How about the fact that they went into captivity with Babylon and Assyria? Even here, After calling God their shepherd, it says, how long will you be angry with the prayer of your people? You see, they suffered and even went into captivity as Israel, and even though it says that he was their shepherd. How about all those curses in Deuteronomy chapter 28? Once again, for the people whom have God as their shepherd. Uh, 2815 says, but it shall come about. Now, this is the shepherd speaking. This is God speaking to Israel, his sheep. It says, but it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and an eating bow. Cursed 
or cursed. Cursed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. It goes, it goes on. Look, some of these curses. Now, these, these are some pretty horrible things if you read through chapter 28. It says, your carcasses, in verse 26, will be food to all the birds of the sky. Egypt, what kind of shepherd is that? Now, here's the problem. First thing I mention is, would Mr. Wagner be consistent? Because in the Old Testament, God is a shepherd, and look at the bad things that happened to his people. And you read throughout the book. Now, this leads us into the second thing I want to say is, the problem with this is, you see, in the Bible, friends, the shepherd analogy, sheep and shepherd, is only one aspect. Maybe you can get a couple of aspects from one analogy, but that doesn't cover everything about the relationship between God and his people. You see, the problem with Mr. Wagner is he's using one analogy, one uh, metaphor or relationship that the Bible speaks of in the terms of shepherd and sheep, and he's taking that beyond what it was meant to do. You know, in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, the devil did the same thing. I'm not calling Mr. Wagner here the devil. That's not my point. I, I think he means all good. But the, the point is, Jesus said, uh, if you throw yourself off here, and he quoted scripture and says, the angels will keep charge over you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. In other words, throw yourself off and see if that's going to happen. And Jesus says, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. You see, the problem is, what the devil did is, he had some truth, but he did not apply other truth that would have limited that or would have shed more light on that. See, that's what he's doing. He's saying, well, he's your shepherd. And if Christians, once saved, can become lost again, that makes him a bad shepherd. No, you see, because there's other relationship aspects than just a sheep shepherd. That's one uh, figurative relationship in the Bible. See, here's the other thing. Jesus is Lord and sovereign. And as Lord, you know what that means? That means we have certain responsibilities. And as responsible individuals made in the image of God, we have to give account. We have to be responsible. Okay? We have to be responsible. And that means we are culpable for our sins. If we go out into sin and we continue therein, besides just being the shepherd, he's Lord. If we continue in willful disobedience, that is not going to say something about the shepherd. It's going to say something about the Lord, and the Lord is going to execute judgment and wrath. You see, the Lord has not promised to keep us saved if we are willful rebels, or if we go back into a life of sin. Now, let's look at some scripture here in 1 Corinthians 6. Paul said, and do you know what Paul was doing with the Corinthians? He calls them brethren, okay? But they had a lot of problems, and he's trying to warn them here in chapter 6. After all the problems, he cited some of those, and he says in verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Well, so what if a Christian, once saved, becomes one of these? Now, I know that our Calvinist friends, we're going to have to have a different discussion. Okay, that's a different discussion for a different time. But for the rest of you who do believe and once saved, always say, I want you to think about this. If a Christian becomes an adulterer, if he lives in adultery, or if he's out having an affair on his wife, is he saved? You know, Charles Stanley would say that he is. Go check out this other video that I have. Now, at the time that this video is posted, I won't have that yet, but I will post it shortly thereafter. Charles Stanley and such like would say, Yes. That's the original lie, friends. That's the original lie of the devil. You shall not surely die. You know what the devil was doing? Why did the devil say that? Why was that the first lie out of his mouth? You know why? Because he wanted to lessen. Now pay attention. The devil wanted to lessen the apprehension that Eve 
And therefore, Adam had about doing what God told them not to do. By lessening the threat, if you do it, you're not going to die. Well, that's what Charles Stanley and such like Baptist preachers and others say. Well, it's not going to be good. You might feel guilty. You might be miserable. You might lose some of your reward in heaven, but you'll still get there. Friends, that's the original lie. The devil is still at it with this original lie. He's trying to lessen your apprehension and your threat or the threat about living in sin. Don't let the devil do that to you. This guy doesn't think he's doing the bidding of the devil. I understand that. His intentions are good. I care about his soul. I care about your soul. But you know what? He's preaching a doctrine of the devil. It was the original lie, and I don't want you to be deceived. One more verse that I want to look at, and then we're going to go back into the video. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says... Well, where we start? Um, let us start in 24. Yeah, let's, let's do 23, actually. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. God is faithful. We need to continue in faith so that we can continue in his mercy. Not forsaken. I'm oh, sorry. Verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaken our own assembling together. So much for you don't have to go to church, as people say. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, for if we go on, now here it is, listen, do not miss this. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment, the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Now, that means exactly what it says. I want you to think about it. It says, if we go on sinning willfully, I say, well, isn't every sin willful? What it means is, if you know you're sinning and you just continue on as if you go back to your sin, if you know you're committing adultery and you just continue to do it, not talking about repentance. Okay, we never are going to be perfect. We do make mistakes, as they say, but the point is, you're doing something you know is wrong, and you just continue to do it, and you go on, and here it means, here's some people, as the habit of some is, that they no longer assemble themselves together, and they just go on sinning willfully. Jesus' blood is not going to cover that, because the atonement is conditional upon faith and repentance. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? See, he's saved. You see, he was sanctified by the blood of the covenant. This isn't what well, somebody was never saved. That's generally what they say. Well, such a person was never saved in the first place. Do not be deceived. This person was sanctified by the blood. Now, some, and the whole text mentions that, about being sanctified. Uh, let's see. For by one offering he, Jesus, has perfected, in verse 14, for all those, for all time, those who are sanctified. It's, this is about the sanctification of Christians. Okay, so it's clear. Do not be deceived. Now, if we go back to our video, we understand now his error is when he says, it really says something about your shepherd. Well, that's one aspect of our relationship and a figurative, you know, a metaphor, an analogy of sheep and shepherd. But the reality is Jesus is also Lord. And as sovereign, we have an obligation to continue in faith and repentance and humility and trust. Okay, so I'm going to back it up just a little bit so we can catch some more of what he says. 
perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. In fact, in the very next verse, John 10, 28. Back it up even more, actually. If Jesus is the one, and he is, by the way, that said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, it says that I give eternal life to them. He gives it to them. It says they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. In fact, in the very next verse, John 10, 28, it says the Father will keep them, and no one will take them out of the Father's hand. All right, so let's go to that text then. John 10, you know, it's, there's some assumptions being made. All right, so my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Well, what about those who follow and stop following and go back? You know, sheep do get, so let's say it like this. He's assuming, or actually I just say this. He's not really answering the problem. What if the sheep rebels? Now, you might think, sheep don't rebel? How silly is that? Well, that's, that's the point. The sheep-shepherd relationship is not trying to uh, encompass every aspect of our relationship. Sheep are followers. That's why the analogy is used. They're following him. But the, the reality is we are human beings that have an obligation, and he is Lord, and if we stop following Okay, he's not going to give eternal life to those who are not following. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. People say, never perish. Mr. Wagner says, never perish. That's right. Those that follow him. We have already seen and we just read some scriptures where it is possible for the Christian to stop following. You know, we face temptations. No temptation overtakes us. Uh, we are told that we are not able to bear. There's not an escape. So the reality is temptations come our way. We are weak in this life. We have temptations and trials and distractions. The reality is we must remain faithful, not perfect. We realize we make mistakes, we stumble, we sin, but we say, I've sinned, I've done wrong, I need to get better. You keep an attitude of humility, trusting in, Lord, in the Lord and His mercy. But we just read scriptures where there are individuals that may do otherwise. And we'll, we'll, we're going to bring out some more scriptures as we move along. But when it says, I give eternal life to them, but it's to those that follow. It isn't eternal life to those that turn around and go the other way. Remember, the sheep-shepherd analogy is just one aspect. Coming back to the reality is we are human beings. If we turn and go the other way, if we rebel, we live in adultery, as an example, he's not going to give you eternal life anymore. See, it's eternal life, but it's conditional. And we're going to get into that more here in just a second. They will never perish, but it's those who follow him. See, he doesn't actually address here whether or not a Christian can actually stop following. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That's right. He's able to protect from wolves. He's able to protect from others that would steal the sheep. This is not the context of the person themselves going back into sin or losing faith. And that's not what Jesus is trying to touch on. He's simply speaking in the shepherd-sheep relationship to make a point. So, this idea about not being able to snatch them out of my hand, okay? If I have my children, and, I, and we're in, out in public, and I say, nobody is going to be able to harm you. No one will be able to take you from me. I'm not talking about whether or not they can hurt themselves, Right? I'm not talking about what they could do to themselves. Okay, if a country opens up its borders to refugees, and, it, and its motto or its policy is, come in here, we will protect you. Nobody will be able to force you out of here. Nobody will be able to take you back. Nobody's going to come in here and seize you. Does that mean the refugee can't leave? You see... When we say such a thing, or when a country might say such a thing, everybody knows that it isn't really trying to talk about the issue of what the refugee himself can do, whether he can stay, whether he can leave. It's trying to talk about what others can do, and we're trying to make a promise about our protection. 
So the problem is, people quote that verse so many times, and they try to apply it to what the Christian will or will not do, or what the Christian can or cannot do, when that's not the point. That is not the point of what Jesus is actually trying to talk about. And to try to read that into the text is to do an injustice to the text. That's not how the Bible is read, friends. That's not what the author is trying to communicate. Jesus is not trying to communicate on what the person, whether he can rebel, go back into sin or not, whether he can remove himself from the hand. And the same thing goes about the Father's hand. So there's really a question about our shepherd and the sufficiency of God. The other thing is, is how... So just to say once again, uh, just to complete that whole argument, it's not... It's not a criticism of God. It doesn't mean God is insufficient. God is Lord. God is sovereign. And God requires us to remain faithful. He does what we cannot do. He forgives our sins. And he saves us through our faith, and whatever that means biblically about being saved by faith. But he requires us to remain faithful. He requires us to continue to trust him and and, and remain in his mercy. God is sufficient lose what you really did nothing to earn except to acknowledge that there's okay what you really did nothing let's back that up and listen really a question about our shepherd and the sufficiency of god the other thing is is how can you lose what you really did nothing to earn except to acknowledge that there's nothing you could ever do to earn it how can you lose what you did nothing to do to earn okay mr wagner i'm sure mr wagner probably will never see this video but let me talk to him nonetheless mr wagner sir you are missing the point The point is not that you have to earn it so as to keep it. Okay, we're not talking about earning it. We're talking about remaining faithful. Not earning it, but continuing in faith. You see, here's the error of what Mr. Wagner is saying. If to say that a Christian has to uh, keep his... uh, To say that a Christian can lose salvation means that a Christian had to keep it or, I'm sorry, had to earn it to keep it. Let me I'll make sure I'm not confusing because I messed up there. Basically, the argument is this. What he would say about my position. He's actually misrepresenting it. He's not addressing the problem. He's saying, if a Christian can lose their salvation, that means that they had to be earning it to keep it. No, Mr. Wagner, no, not earn it. You have to remain faithful. Okay, if I... If I uh, allow my children to play in the park and but I don't like their behavior and I say stop behaving the way you are out there but they don't and I remove them from the park okay the fact that they were taken out of the park because they did not keep my the parents conditions does that mean they had to actually earn it to stay in the park does the fact that they were removed from the park means that in order to stay in the park they had to earn the right to be there well let me say it like this if I give my child a uh, Nintendo game, somehow they call them Nintendos, I don't know these days. If I give them a Nintendo set, did he earn the Nintendo? Did my children earn the Nintendo? No. And earn it. It's a grace. It's a gift. It's, a, it's grace. But I have certain conditions about how they behave. And if they don't behave the right way and I take the Nintendo away, that doesn't mean, well, so... How can they lose what they did not earn because they did not keep the conditions? See, that's the point. Mr. Wagner, I want you to listen to this. Pastor Wagner is actually conflating cost, I'm sorry, merit with conditions. It's not about earning it. It's about keeping the conditions, which is faith. If a, if a Christian goes out and commits adultery and lives that way, he's not keeping the conditions of faith. He's not continuing in faith and repentance and humility. Mr. Wagner is confusing conditions with merit. Nobody is making the argument that you have to earn your salvation in order to keep it. We're saying you have to keep the conditions. You never earn it. We didn't earn it to get it. We never earn it because we're never perfect. We continue in faith so that our sins may be forgiven through our faith, that we may continue to be justified by our faith. But we never earn it. That's not the argument. 
Christian doesn't have to earn it to keep it. He has to remain in the condition of faith and repentance, humility, trusting in the mercy of the Lord. He's confusing mercy. He's confusing merit with conditions. All right. Uh, Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not according to deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and by the renewing of his spirit. The classic verse, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace, in other words, unmerited favor, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And That's right. Grace is unmerited favor. But we're not meriting our salvation at any time. We are keeping, we are remaining in faith. So if it's by grace through faith, it stands to reason, does it not, friends, that you have to remain, have to remain in faith. A little tongue-tied here tonight. But you get my point. He's conflating merit with conditions. Those verses that he mentioned in Titus and Ephesians, yes, we cannot earn our salvation, but we do have to keep the condition of faith. Not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, not as a result of works so that no man should boast. But we also know that James tells us in chapter 2 that faith without works is dead. I love what Augustine said a long time ago, that we are saved by grace through faith alone, but the faith which saves is never alone. It's always accompanying something. Now, here's the deal. There are some people who attend church, who walk forward at different events, who said something when they were younger, maybe when they were 46 years old, they said, hey, I think I believe in who Jesus is. You need to understand biblically what believe means. Because when you do believe, it says that you have eternal life. That's John 3, 14, like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. It says that the Son of Man will be lifted up. And in verse uh, 15, it says, whoever believes in him will inherit eternal life. That Did you listen to that? The very passage he just cited from the Old Testament showed the condition, the uh, conditional nature of their healing. Moses, when the people sinned and were bitten by serpents out of the judgment of God, and then they, you know, they said, hey, save us, please, we're sorry. Okay, in his mercy, God said, all right, here's what you do. Make a, uh, make a serpent and put it on a pole, a, you know, fashion a a serpent, and put it on a pole and lift it up. And whoever looks at it is going to be healed. And that's what they did. But do you see the conditional nature? Right? Now, what did they, what did they need that for in the first place? Because they did the wrong things. They sinned. They rebelled. Well, what if they got healed and then they rebelled again? Wouldn't they need healing once again? And they, so here's the point. He's not understanding the conditional nature of these things, as I just described it to you. Eternal life, not temporary life. Backing up. Eternal life. It says that the Son of Man will be lifted up, and verse uh, 15 says, <laughs> Whoever believes in Him will inherit eternal life, not conditional life, not temporary life. But. First of all, Mr. Wagner. It is conditional life if you have to believe. Believing itself is the condition. I mean, you're missing it, and it's right there in the text. It is conditional life. Now, I don't know why people have a hard time when they think that eternal life cannot be conditional. So in other words, they say, I'm going to pull the video back up here in a second. Well, it says eternal life. It doesn't say conditional life. Eternal and conditional are not exclusive. Just think of Adam and Eve. Did Adam and Eve have eternal life before they sinned? Oh, you better believe it, both physically and spiritually, okay? They didn't have any sins before they ate of the tree. Therefore, they didn't have any sins to need repenting of. So there was no fear of spiritual death, and there was no fear of physical death. That means they had eternal life. But they lost it, didn't they? Oh, they absolutely did. So it was eternal, but it was conditional upon I just say this, their faith, actually, because if they had stopped, if they would not have believed the devil and they continued to trust God, they wouldn't have eaten. But the devil wanted them to distrust. Okay, but here's the point. It was conditional. Eternal life is conditional upon faith. So the point is, right there in the text that he read, Mr. Wagner misses the whole point. It is conditional life. It's eternal life that's conditional upon believing. 
And the way that he defines faith, I'd actually agree with. But to pull that back up, he misses it right there in the text. Now, he also says not, not temporal life. Uh, that's something that nobody ever said. Nobody ever argued that Jesus gives temporal life. What we say is he gives eternal life, but he gives it conditionally. Friends, we have to make sure that we're understanding. People are always making these kinds of errors. Jesus doesn't give temporal life. People tell me all the time, no, that's right. Nobody ever said that he did. He gives eternal life, friends, but he gives it conditionally. Make sure we are not deceived. Eternal life. They will have eternal life, but the word belief implies trust, faith, execution, relationship. It doesn't mean that you just have... Uh... Now, I would actually agree with that. Faith means trust, faith, execution, relationship. That's absolutely true. So if you're believing, but at some point you get tempted and you give in and you stop repenting and you are stop trusting, you stop having a relationship, if you will, as it says there, well, what would that mean then? You see... Even the way he describes faith shows the conditional nature of our salvation. Word information is not just knowledge. It doesn't even mean you agree with knowledge and you assent that it's true. It has to do with trust. Jesus says there's going to be some people that look like they have a relationship with him that he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Let me read this. I keep flipping back and forth here as I'm not looking. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Now, if you look at that text, what about those who stop doing the will of the Father? See, these texts are not actually helping him. They're actually showing the conditional nature of salvation. You have to be doing the will of the Father. That does not mean you have to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. Let's face it, right? What it means is the will of the Father is that you continue in faith, trusting in His mercy, repenting when you sin, acknowledging it, growing as 2 Peter chapter 1 teaches, growing as a Christian, getting better and better. That's the will of the Father. The will of the Father is not uh, going out, living a life of sin, right? Becoming an atheist, perhaps, because you become deceived and enter into some foolishness, right? Who is in heaven will enter. That doesn't mean you're saved by what you do. It just means if you're saved, again. I didn't even understand what that really meant. But the faith which saves is never alone. It's not dead, ineffective. And so some of those folks are even going to do miraculous signs and, uh, and, and do things. God's going to use them. Judas cast out demons, but he was the son of perdition, John 17 tells us. He was a devil from the beginning earlier in John. Okay? We're saved because of a relationship with Jesus Christ alone. But a relationship with Jesus Christ has with it a regenerated life where the Holy Spirit indwells you. Okay? And saints persevere. We are eternally secure if we're Christ's sheep. But Christ's sheep... We are eternally secure if we're Christ's sheep. You want to know what the Bible actually says about being secure? Do you want to know? He actually said the word per persevere. I'm going to see. Let's read that again, or rather listen. Persevere. We have a life where the Holy Spirit indwells you. Okay? Now, I'm not touching on absolutely everything that he says and some things I don't even agree with, but they're not all that important right now. And saints persevere. We are eternally secure. Saints persevere. What does the Bible actually say about persevering? Well, let's take a look. Let's go to 2 Peter. Now I'm going to read this. It's kind of long. Well, it ain't too long. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory. And excellence. For by these he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, he's assuming his readers have faith, supply moral excellence 
and in your moral excellence, knowledge. This is that growth that I just spoke about earlier. You have to grow as a Christian. Your faith, you have to continue to study and put into practice things that you read. And you, yeah, you'll sin. You say, I shouldn't have done that. You learn better. You repent. You keep your humility and you keep growing and growing and you get better and better. Okay, so you supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. There's that word. You know how saints persevere as they're continually growing and adding to their faith and their virtues by the grace of God, by the study of his scriptures and putting it into practice. And in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. All right. Now, we just read that. Now, Mr. Wagner said, saints persevere. Peter just talked about perseverance. The growing Christian. Now, what does he say in verse 8? For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, right? They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighting, had it having forgotten his purification from his former sins. This isn't somebody, in other words, the man who lacks these, not necessarily somebody who was never saved. Because once again, that's what they always like to say. Well, if a person lacks these and doesn't increase, never was saved. No, friends, do not be deceived. I care about your souls. I don't want you to be deceived. Because this person has forgotten his purification from his former sins. It's the Christian who's not increasing, who doesn't add these qualities to himself. Notice this. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent and make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. It stands to reason, my friends, that if you do not add these qualities, if you do not have diligence in your calling to grow as a Christian, bettering yourself each and every day for the rest of your life as a Christian, and making your calling certain, what does it mean, friends? You will stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. But what does he say? If these qualities are yours, what if they're not? And since he says, having, in verse 9, forgotten his purification from his former sins, that means someone who has been purified from their former sins may, if they're not diligent, not have these qualities and get worse and worse. That's how the saint perseveres. This is what the Bible teaches, not what Mr. Wagner is actually teaching. Do not let preachers and teachers fool you. Do not give in to the original lie in modern day. You shall not surely die. That is the devil's lie in the beginning. Uh, let's see if there was more. Christ's sheep, but Christ's sheep, as a rule bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Watch this. One last thing. Great verse. Uh, Jude 24. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to make you stand in his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. That's who we give honor to. Now, yes, that verse, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. But is it unconditional? You see, Mr. Wagner is assuming that it is unconditional. He's going to keep you. God is going to keep you from stumbling unconditionally. No, that's not right. He's going to keep you from stumbling. We just read about stumbling in this verse. There's the word right there. It's in verse 10. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. You see, God has given us all things. He's given us the knowledge. He's forgiven of our sins, forgiven us of our sins. And if we do these things in humility, this isn't perfection. This is someone who's growing. If you're perfect, you stop growing. We never become perfect. If we're always growing and becoming better Christians, that's what faith is. That's perseverance. We read it in the text. That's the Christian that will never stumble. God is able to make you stumble, 
Sorry. God is able to keep you from stumbling. Uh, I'm very, uh, I'm fumbling all over my words tonight. It's been a long day. But my point is this. Mr. Wagner is assuming that God will keep you from stumbling unconditionally. But that's not the truth. He's able to keep you from stumbling through the teaching of the New Testament. By forgiveness in your faith, by repentance and humility. The things that we read about in the New Testament. And as you read in 2 Peter, friends, it is conditional, absolutely. What Mr. Wagner is preaching is wrong. It is unbiblical. And you know, at the beginning of his video, he said, if it's not in the Word, forget what you heard. You know what you should forget? What Mr. Wagner has taught you. I don't want you to forget the errors, though. Understand why what he has said is wrong. That's what I've been trying to point out. Let's finish this video here. Lose your salvation? How about this? Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. I'm a created thing. So if it's given to me by Jesus, a created thing can't lose it. All right? And so that is... Is that the point of Paul in Romans chapter 8? This is a popularly cited passage about once saved, always saved, how a Christian cannot lose their salvation. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And as he says here, nor any other created thing, it says, and he says, I'm a created thing. Is that what Paul is trying to teach? If you read the context, friends, context is king. Context teaches that in our trials and persecutions, if we continue in our faith, we have a promise of salvation. But it is conditional. We've been reading that. Now, when he says, I'm a created thing, once again, this is reading somebody's theology into the text, and that's an abuse of the text. Uh, This is what I talked about in the very beginning. Now, if a country tells a refugee nothing will... uh, No other country, no other person can force you out. Well, I use that one. Actually, let me say this. If a teacher in her classroom finds out that other students have been bullying and picking on and messing with some student, and she puts a stop to it, and she tells this kid, she says, listen, I'm not going to let any other student mess with you. No student is going to do you harm again. What if the student says, oh, wait a minute, I'm a student, so I can't do myself harm? Now you say, that's silly, AK. Well, friends, that's the point. We understand what a person is trying to communicate by what they're saying. What Paul is saying is that no other force is going to get between you and God. That doesn't mean nor imply that you can't become a rebel, that you can't become an adulterer, that you can't give into temptation, that you can't stop uh, repenting and humbling yourself at the cross of Christ and saying, I did wrong, please forgive me. That doesn't mean you can't stop doing that. That's not the point of Paul's text. And it is misusing what the Bible is saying to say such a thing. Mr. Wagner is wrong. He's putting his theology into the text. He's making Paul say something that Paul is not trying to communicate. You go back to Romans 6. And we will end on this note. Romans 6, you know, comes before Romans 8. And my point there is, you've learned just the opposite of what Mr. Wagner is teaching before you ever get to Romans chapter 8. And so, it says this. Verse 12 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey it in its lust. What if you do? And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves... To God is those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but but under grace. But what did it say? What does it goes on to say? He just gave that warrant. He gave that commandment. And then he says in verse 16, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? 
So if you obey sin, what does Paul say is going to happen? You're going to die. Well, if you're a Christian, that means you're going to die again. You're going to die spiritually once again by presenting yourselves as a slave of sin, which he said up here, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Well, doesn't Paul know? If Mr. Wagner was correct, Paul, of all people, should surely know that that's not possible. Because if it means dying spiritually, which he just said it did in verse 16, that means he surely couldn't do it. But as Mr. Stanley, Charles Stanley, would say, yeah, he could do it. He can go on and live a life of sin, but he'd still be saved. Well, that's not what Paul teaches. And if you're a Calvinist, and if Paul was, you know, if Paul taught what Calvinists say he taught, then surely Paul would know that you can't let sin reign in your mortal body if you're a Christian. And therefore, what's the point? But I'm not going to get into Calvinism. And I think that will be the end of what I have to say. Friends, do not believe the modern version of the original lie. You shall die if you live a life of sin. You don't have to earn it. You just have to continue in the condition of faith. I really hope that this has been a benefit from you. I'm not trying to demean anybody. I'm trying to present the truth. What Mr. Wagner and such like preachers teach once saved, always saved, is false. It is unbiblical. Do not be deceived. Friends, I... Contact me for any questions, further comments. I appreciate you listening. Thank you and God bless.